Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to uh, Common Reason Bible Study. Those of you watching online, if my gaze is directed only to this side of the room, that's because that's where people are sitting. We decided not to deal with the chairs this morning, uh, expecting a light crowd with the rain and Tim being gone. Uh, So we want to make it look full. So I'm looking that way. Yeah, well, it is what it is. Um, Let's start with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for um, another Sabbath day, another opportunity to get a better glimpse of your infinite love for us. We ask a uh, continued baptism by the Holy Spirit. Um, we uh, are grateful for this um, opportunity to study openly um, as we, our consciences dictate. Uh, we pray for those of our group who are not with us. Please bring them safely back in the weeks ahead and guide uh, Tim and his continued ministry as he is in California delivering the message. Bring them safely back as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, yeah, I believe Tim is in somewhere in California uh, speaking with a group out there. So we wish them uh, well. How, how many got outside this week? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's been uh, unseasoned for those of you not here. Um, temperatures approaching 70 are unusual uh, here this time of year, and we've had almost two straight weeks of it. Beg your pardon? 77. <laughs> I didn't think it got that hot, but yeah, it's 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 been, you know, we may have a day here and there when it warms up, but uh, to have two, two straight weeks of it is uh, pretty nice. I don't expect it to last, and that usually is a, a prelude to a blizzard, but whatever. <laughs> we'll, we'll deal with that if it comes. We're studying Lesson 5 today, uh, the baptism and filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as we kind of move through this today, you know, it keeps some, there's some, there's some nagging questions that uh, kept bothering me, or kept coming up in my head as, as I was prepping and, and um, doing the notes for the lesson. What exactly does it mean to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? What is, is it a one-time deal and you're done? Is it a monthly thing? Is it hourly? Is it daily? Is it continual? Uh, I, I, well, how does it function? How does it relate to water baptism? How does it relate to the baptism of repentance as John uh, referred to, John the Baptist referred to things. Um, How does it relate to our own baptisms when we were, we reached the age of accountability as it's termed and we were baptized in front of a church. Um, what, what, What does it mean? Any thoughts before we jump in? daily, moment by moment. I mean, that's what I feel like it is to me. Um, When you're baptized by the Spirit, it's such a part of your life that you live according to what He speaks to you constantly during the day. Okay. You know, we have to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives for Him to become a part of our lives. And I think by doing so, then we do His will. So I think it's a daily thing. All right, so we have a choice in the matter, is what I hear you saying. Uh, it's a daily uh, or continual uh, baptism and filling by the Holy Spirit. I, I, I like where you're going with that. I, I kind of had that, I developed that same mindset as well. Yes? I agree with that. And then I think there are also moments when we are even more in tune with the Spirit, when we are like fasting or asking for special prayer or devoting a special time in our lives. Uh, Time period that we are wanting a deeper filling of the Holy Spirit than our daily walk. Okay, so again, I hear you. I hear you saying that we're playing a role. We may either be the limiting factor or the welcoming factor in the process. The Holy Spirit is not um, is not going to go. It's not going to come into our lives uninvited. It's not going to force His way in. Uh, and if if we're lacking in that department, the problem is here, not with Him. Yes. Oh, I didn't see another. Yeah, in the back. I think there are also epiphany moments uh, where, where 
um, the Holy Spirit brings you to uh, times of uh, pivotal deep differences and there can be a sense of truly being just overwhelmed and washed with and sometimes people I think refer to that also as the baptism of the Holy Spirit whenever that is uh, um, such a hard shift and truly uh, that sense of synergy and alignment and uh, greater understanding that I think um, also falls into that category. Okay. I saw another hand. Did you have a comment, question? Um, to me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when we actually accept God's character into our lives. And we know that and trust with all of our heart that He will be with us always. And that we have to start every day by asking God to come into our lives, to ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. And when we go through our trials and our tribulations, we need to continue to pray, please, please, please be with us. Sometimes I beg the Holy Spirit to be with me. Not because I don't trust that he's not with me, because I need him more than ever. I don't know about you guys, but I've found that uh, in periods of trial and tribulation, that's when it's easiest to seek out the Holy Spirit. It tends to be more difficult when things are going great. I'm good. I got, I got this life thing wired. I'm kicking, you know what? It's, it's, tough to, it's tough to pause and, and ask for a greater measure of the Holy Spirit in those times. I look at it as kind of three areas. Okay, first, he's, maybe I have no interest in spiritual things, and he's wooing my heart, you know, softening me, bringing me to a point of seeing my need so that I do accept the Lord, okay? And then once I accept him and ask him to come into my life, I ask him to start really changing me and cleaning me up and getting all areas of my heart emptied so he can fill me so I have a greater capacity to hold the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. to be used by the Holy Spirit. And then I think as we have the commission to do something outside of us, and that's to have love for everybody else, to be able to even spread the gospel, to even be effective in somebody else's life. I mean, let's say I get up and I'm having the Sabbath school class, okay? Well, you know, you might have a perfect presentation, but if the Holy Spirit isn't filling you and filling them, okay, it's not going to do any good. Right. So I kind of see it as three. Okay, I, I, like, I like where you're going with that. Any, any scriptural basis for that thought process? <laughs> Anyway, this triggering anything in our computers. What was the first thing you said? Well, the wooing. The wooing. Mm -hmm. Wendell? Well, there's discussion in, in at the book of Acts <laughs> that kind of goes along with this, and that is Acts 18 and 19. And in two situations, one was Apollos, and another was a group of uh, people who were believers, described as believers, who had been baptized with the baptism of John. And Paul came up and said, and this is truly repentance, which we only get from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But when Paul came and said, do you know the way of God? And then he explained in the baptism of Jesus Christ, and they were rebaptized. I don't fully understand why they had to be, but anyway. But in, in, in that process, they received a greater gift of the Holy Spirit. And they, they then started preaching with power what was going on. So I think that is a stepwise fashion in which they were being brought to God. Both repentance, they knew about Christ, but they were, they were the baptism of John with repentance, and then they, um, Paul came and, and others, and they accepted a fuller understanding and were more filled with his spirit than they were before. Okay, good. Um, I, what triggered my mind was, uh, I think it was Romans 2, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So uh, here we are. We, we see the kindness of God is revealed by Jesus of Nazareth. The Holy Spirit is working on our hearts. Whether we believe in the Holy Spirit or not, whether we believe in God or not, the Holy Spirit is still try, you know, knocking at the door, trying to apply, apply these uh, things in our lives. And when, when we recognize it and realize it, it leads us to repentance. And then second step, the invitation uh, you know, search me and seek me and find the wicked way in me and cleanse me from unrighteousness. Uh, and then the third step is the 
going out and by, by their fruits you shall know them. Uh, uh, you know, demonstrating our, the transformation of character in our lives and sharing what, sharing what uh, the Holy Spirit and Christ has done for us and, and you know, with others and, and loving others more than you love yourself. Yeah, I, I, I like where you went with that very much. Do you have a comment in the back? It would be, I have loved you with an everlasting love and called you with love and kindness that will be. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so Sabbath lesson. Um, the memory text, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. No, excuse me. The thief cometh not but to kill, steal and kill and destroy. I am come that they may have life and may have life more abundantly. This is John 10.10. 10. Um, and he also returns as a thief in the night, which is an interesting metaphor. <laughs> right. Interesting metaphor. Interesting parallel, or some would say contradiction. So um, I, I'm, I'm still not quite sure why um, that memory text was chosen, uh, but according to this same author, uh, you know, here we are, John 10:10. 10, 10, a few chapters later, what does John define as life abundantly, or we, we, we could substitute eternally for abundantly? What's the definition of life eternal? That they may know you, the one true God in Jesus Christ, whom we have sent. You guys ever consider where or when the entire the process of baptism started? Did, it, did John start it? Creation? Who was baptized at creation? Oh, the baptism, sorry. Yeah, not Sabbath, baptism. You really don't hear about it until John. No, what happened is... Well, we, we have some pre... We have some pre um, you don't hear about it in abundance until John. I'll give you that. There are some prefigurings of it in the Old Testament when Naaman's told to go and bathe in the River Jordan, dip himself in the River Jordan seven times. Correct. That's right. But it, it kind of it pre, pre-symbolizes, in my opinion. Yes, Lisa. Nice to have you back, by the way. I've heard a parallel with the flood and baptism that... Um, um, no, no one, his family, in essence, were baptized by water, and those that chose not to come onto the ark uh, were not baptized. But I don't know. I just read that this week, actually, somewhere. Well, Noah was kept kind of dry, and the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you went right where I was going. Uh, I, my, my mind was thinking the same thing. Uh, the eight people who didn't get submerged are the ones who lived. Um, in the, in the description of the children of Israel going to the uh, Red Sea, they're described as being baptized. They didn't get wet. Okay, that's, did. that's good. But that was, the description of them was that they were baptized. So, interesting that, uh, okay, here we are. We have, we have some symbolism here now that ba- the baptism or ritual of baptism doesn't necessarily mean you have to get doused. Submerged. You don't have to hold your breath. Yes. What you had also was an epiphanal experience. And what yes. you have been brought through, whether it's the flood and surviving through or whether it's walking through on dry ground while you have the waters beside you and the army behind you, but it's an epiphanal experience. It, it, it has that uh, opportunity to truly make uh, a complete shift in understanding. So there might be some connection, I hear, between trust you know, it, it trust, even though you don't know the outcomes, trusting in, in a God who's looking out for your best interests and following, whether it's through the Red Sea or whether it's through the River Jordan. If or you're not considering immersion to be mandatory for baptism, why don't we honor sprinkling? Yeah, exactly. Well, there are people who come into the church on profession of faith oh, absolutely. who may have been sprinkled and not baptized. So. Or for medical reasons can't right. be baptized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems like the lesson tried to make a, a case for water baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit. As necessary, a precursor to receiving the Holy yeah. Spirit? Yeah, I, felt, I saw that too. Finally reached the point where um, baptism is a teaching tool. It's not a salvation tool. It's Good of those theater yeah. activities and uh, the, the 
I, I just have to separate them because it's not a precursor to. Well said. <coughs> Listen to this. This is from um, one of the early Christian historians named Justin Martyr in his, in his uh, piece called First Apology. <coughs> and the devils, indeed, having heard this washing published by the prophet, I believe he's referring to Prophet Jeremiah, instigated those who entered their temples and are about to approach them with libations and burnt offerings that they also sprinkle themselves and cause them, the pagans, also to wash themselves entirely as they depart from the sacrifice before they enter into the shrines in which their images are set. Have you ever considered any pagan influence in baptism? Okay, there are... There was widely understood that those who were initiated into the, quote, mysteries of Egypt, um, they would often be buried in a casket for a certain amount of time. And when they were, when the casket was opened, they were considered to have been baptized or, quote, born again. Okay, so... This, this author suggests that, um, you know, Satan's militia kind of read through scriptures and said, hmm, not only do we have a coming Messiah, but this is the symbology which is going to, it, which the, the, the baptism by water is going, to pre, is going to symbolize a different baptism. We need to integrate this into our practices first. Disturbing, isn't it? <laughs> And how did, how did Christianity get from a baptism by water or the baptism of repentance to the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I mean, what's the whole point of the baptism of water? And I think we've already, we've already touched on this. It was suggested that it's, it's a symbolic. It's a precursor. It's a... Um, it, it, a witness of repentance. It's a, it, okay, good. That's that's what I. That's a better way of putting it than what I was just trying to think of. It's and and without repentance, can the Holy Spirit fill your heart and mind? If you're still, if you still have the heart of a rebel. It's a Say again. Repentance is the key aspect. It's the first key aspect. I, yes, I agree. But we can't come to repent without the Holy Spirit. Correct. Yeah, it, interesting how that works, isn't it? This, uh, this was a quote that Tim read last week, um, but I think it bears repeating. From Desire of Ages 671. It is the Spirit, Holy Spirit, that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character on his church. Uh, I've included a couple of other um, Ellen White quotes in the note that I, I'm not going to go over all of them. This is also from Desire of Ages 172. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but it's a transformation of nature. Okay, that, that, that's a fantastic sentence right there. The Christian's life is not a modification or an improvement of the old. It is a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. The change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. So this is from the teacher's lesson. Quote, this week's lesson should help members of your class be aware that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for a select few or for a small group of spiritually elite Christians. The baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit is for all believers in every generation. When we become insensitive to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, we live the Christian life in our own strength, powerless to overcome temptation. We live in frustrated defeat rather than joyous victory. Our decisions are based on human wisdom rather than divine guidance. We are caught in the grip of seemingly unbreakable habits rather than enjoying the freedom that the Spirit of Christ brings. Amen, folks. 
That is well said. <laughs> Sunday's lesson, baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've already touched on this. Why, why the baptism by water? Why not just wait on the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What, what, are, are, there, what are the similarities and differences between the two? Any thoughts? Similarities. What are the similarities between baptism of water and a baptism by the Holy Spirit? <laughs> okay, good, good. All if, if it's done by immersion, yes, it, it covers all of you. Sometimes it even gets inside the nostrils and sinuses, and you know that handkerchief doesn't is not always effective. Both of them, you have to make a choice. Okay, good. Say that again. Both of them, you have to make a choice. You have to choose. Both of them, you should be making a conscious choice, not coerced by your parents or loved ones or wife or husband or anyone else. And it's not just coverage; it's washing away the old. It's not just squirting perfume on the stink. <laughs> Washing away the odor. <laughs> Bless the French. Yeah, it's not just it's not perfuming and covering up the odor. Okay, it's a washing. Good. Okay, even you know God in in the children of Israel, he, he had them go through ritual washings before they would uh, uh, do their feast days or weekly Sabbath or or whatever. You know, he had them actually cleanse themselves. You're demonstrating to others your inner um, decisions. Okay, so there's a there's a public um, pronouncement of my intention to go down this pathway, um, and and it, it's it can also be a public request for help and guidance in going down this pathway. I, I know many many are baptized at you know 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. You know, their brains aren't developed enough to, to make rational decisions yet, for the most part, and they need guidance. They need parental and communal guidance. All right, what are some of the differences between the baptism by water and the baptism of the Holy Spirit? One is much more visible. Which? Water is much more visible, you know, Immediately. I agree. Over the long haul, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life will be very visible. But Yeah, in the short term, you're right. The, the baptism by water is, is, is far more visible. What, Good. What, I mean, unless, I, I don't see many of us walk around with dual flames of fire over our head. So, um, you know, to that point, it, you're right. It is a long-term you have to look at someone's life over a long-term change, and you have to know what the fruits of the Spirit are, which we'll discuss later in the lesson. We end up with time. Um, so, yes, what are some other differences? By water is a one-time thing. <coughs> Good. Okay, yeah. We, we don't typically get baptized every Sabbath. Yeah, good. Yeah, like every day. Yeah, or day. Well... Most of us take a shower every day, although that's not really yeah, but you considered baptism. It with the communion service. Okay, so that's four times a year. Or whenever, depending on what your beliefs are. You know. Yeah. Okay, or it could be weekly. Any other differences? <clears throat> I think with both the following Christ's example of going down to John the Baptist to, to be baptized with water and also he had already obviously been walking in the spirit for a while but <laughs> to have God pronounce this is my son whom I'm walking right with. yeah I, why, why would Christ need a baptism of repentance anyway I mean seriously he, he didn't he led a life of example and that was just one of many examples yeah. correct so he, he, he set the example for the symbology Baptism by water is just a symbol. It doesn't good. Anything. Excellent. Yeah, it le it's supposed to lead us to a greater cosmic reality. Baptism by the Holy Spirit. Ellen White says Christ's death would have been of no avail if it weren't for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that is really excellent. In, in water. Yes. What, the baptism of water is like um, emptying. Like emptying us, like it's we're we're emptying ourselves of self. Okay. And the spirit is filling us. Good. 
I hadn't thought of that one. All right, also from the lesson. John, however, this is, I think, Sunday's lesson. John, however, in contrast to the other Gospels, does not use the future tense when speaking about baptism of the Spirit. Instead, he uses the present participle, indicating that this is something that has continuing validity. They reference John 1.33. The same tense is used by John just a few verses earlier in John 1.29 when he talks about another important work, quote, the taking away the sins of the world. <clears throat> is that what Christ spoke about, taking away the sins of the world? Yes. I hear crickets. I, yes, it is. It's an ongoing process, a daily process. Kind of a, kind of a technical, I mean, a, a technical trick question. Did he talk about taking away the sins of the world or the sin of the world? Sin. 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 Okay, I looked up 25 different translations of that text, and only one of them had sins. And it was, and I've included these in the notes, the Aramaic Bible in plain English, which is one I've never heard of. Who knows? Maybe that's the correct one. The other 24 translations say, quote, the next day John saw Jesus coming into him. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay. This, I, I wanted to bring this up because Woven in, it's an implied plural. Yes, and, and woven into much of what we read, not only in you know Christian literature but Adventist literature as well, is that sins are a commodity to be uh, traded or blotted out or something like that. Okay. It's acts. Yeah. It, it's acts. Behaviors, behaviors, acts. That's not what Christ came to take away. He came to take away our nature. Condition. Our condition, our terminal condition. Our when, we refer, when we refer to a person as being sick, we refer to them as having a disease, generally singular, even though they may be infected with more than one pathogen. Yeah. I think the analogy is very similar to what you're talking about. Right. He didn't come to take away the symptoms of cancer. He came to take away the cancer. Yeah, and your cancer can be multiple types and multiple organs. Correct. Simultaneously. All right, Monday's lesson, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, again, from the lesson, if we yield to the influence of alcohol, our walk, talk, and thoughts will be negatively affected. Affected negatively, excuse me. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we yield every part of our life to his transforming influence with the result that our walk, talk, and thoughts will reflect Jesus. <coughs> What sort of law is being described here? I be holding your change. Good. Okay. What law? What law umbrella does that fall under? The natural law. Design. design law, but specifically, which of the design laws? Worship. The law of worship. By beholding, we become changed. Okay. Um. What, what exactly is it that, quote, alcohol or any other um, mind-altering substance, what does it do? How does it function well, in, in, within a natural law umbrella? It interrupts a natural process. Okay. It, it, it keeps our brain from functioning uh, at a normal state. It damages neurons. It destroys reason. It's in violation with the laws of health. Thank you. But we, like you mentioned before, it can be a life-saving endeavor. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And so it's exactly be, right. It's a substance which can be used for good and ill. Correct. You know, like money or a gun. It interacts with our body in unique ways or with other chemicals in unique ways to both either 
poison or protect. Well said. That's correct. Very contextual application and response. Yes. Yeah, I, I, and the priest overdose? Yeah. Wow. Wow. What? Well, alcohol is also used as a carrier for other meds as well. You use it as a solvent for the carrier for the meds. You, you should know that as well. And you're best using it in an alcohol base versus giving it to them in water because it won't dissolve. It's also used in NyQuil. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also, the, there was a, a church member was seen coming out of a bar, uh, and you know, uh, it was on the Sabbath day, and boy, the rumors spread. Well, come to find out, his daughter was with fever and ill at home, and the alcohol bath to be able to, to bring the fever down is what had historically been done. That was the, the family tradition, and it was out of his incredible loving heart to go and get the alcohol to be able to, to um, help care for the family member. And that so works. I want to know how to do it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to think you'd have to use some pretty high proof alcohol. Uh, yeah. You can probably get a better reaction using isopropyl and put them yeah. in front of a fan. But. Exactly, yeah. That, don't do that, people. Do not take yeah. that. That Thank is you. not a good idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. From one of our physicians. Okay, good. Physicians and watch that are not to be actually passed yeah. on yeah. the corporate. So. There are better ways of solving the problem. So those remedies are just above witchcraft. Okay, good. In that case, the problem itself is solving the problem. Yeah, right. It's uh, this rem this remind this passage reminded me of, uh, and we've talked about this before, but it's still it's always funny. When uh, when we were in um, San Antonio, the GC, uh, yeah, six or eight of us had gone out to dinner one night after the thing had closed down, and we're walking back. We walked by a bar, and I there was, they this bar had a chalkboard outside. Uh, you know, kind of advertising, hey, whatever. And bear in mind that all the all the restaurants and and all the the downtown businesses in San Antonio, they they knew full well what you know what Adventism was, what audience they were coming, to, and and the bars were looking at, man, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have two weekends of you know diminished business. So this guy had put on his chalkboard, alcohol is your enemy. The Bible says, love your enemy. <laughs> uh, I, and I, 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 I lifelong regret that I didn't. Ever, I never took a picture of it. In our discussions like this, we, I, I often think about the proverb. You know, there's a way that seems right to the man, but leads to destruction. Wait, you know, not all of our firmly held beliefs will get us to where we want to go. Yep. You know. Also well said. So back on your paragraph here, the influence of you know the substances, mm -hmm. uh, they very rarely just affect that individual. Okay, now that's another that's another great point. There are often there's often collateral damage with uh, loved ones or the pedestrian that you hit while you're driving drunk or you know whatever. I like what Lindell said. A firmly held belief can actually be the biggest deterrent to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can believe something so that it becomes your... your I, uh, that's why humanity's in this mess to begin with. Adam and Eve, or Eve believed a lie, and Adam sinned willingly. Well, yeah, you, you, a firmly held belief in a lie that God's not trustworthy? Well, the belief becomes the end in itself, and that's not the end. Yeah. And that comes down to the, the daily uh, seeking out the Holy Spirit for guidance and uh, direction that was brought up. Good. All right, again from the lesson, and I think this is also very well said. Uh, in the Greek of Acts 13.52, the term filled with the Spirit is in the imperfect tense, signifying a continuous action, which has been uh, mentioned here uh, several times already. It literally means being, parenthetically, continuously filled. Being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time event. It is something that we should seek to receive, seek and receive every day. This filling has to be repeated so that every part of our lives is filled with His presence. And so we are empowered to live as we should. 
Being filled with the Spirit does not so much mean that we possess more of him, but he possesses more of us. I think that's a, I think it's a great line. All right, so Tuesday's lesson. Before you go on. Yes. The last paragraph on Monday just summed up the whole thing, and I, I, I thought... Read it, please. They should have started out with this first. It's uh, from manuscript release. Mm. It says, I mm. wish to impress upon you the fact that those who have Jesus abiding in the heart by faith have actually received the Holy Spirit. Every individual who receives Jesus as his personal Savior just as surely receives the Holy Spirit to be his counselor, sanctifier, guide, and witness. Mm -hmm. I thought that was spot on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we, <clears throat> we're going to touch on this a little bit later, but we, we often have, we, f we continually tend to put the cart, try to put the cart before the horse. Uh, you know, we, we, we tell ourselves that um, we need the Holy Spirit before we get baptized, or we need, we need to be obedient before we get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, or we need good works before we um, come to repentance. So, you know, what, whatever the case is, you know, whatever the... It, it, Christianity just always seems to get things backwards. Okay, instead of instead of looking at a transformed character and a transformed life leading to changed uh, changed behaviors, we look at the behaviors. During our sermon last week, we listened to it online, and it was basically saying Jesus, the love of God, is the road to travel, and every road has two ditches. Mm -hmm. One ditch is to try to add Jesus to your religion. The other one is to try to add religion to your Jesus. And hence kind of twist it. And, and the road is Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's his love and his changing through the Holy Spirit of your life. That made a lot of sense to me. Well, the thing about this too is all good things come from the Holy Spirit. So we don't even have a desire to do good until the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Because we have no good in us. That's good. Yes, no, that's right. And, you know, we, this was told, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden. I will put enmity between your seed and the seed of the serpent. Okay? Because if God hadn't intervened <clears throat> in that manner to keep in check the, the, the state of rebellion that humanity had put themselves in, the species would have been eradicated. I think it would have been eradicated before the flood came. You know, we're told we're not told a whole lot history-wise about the state of things before the flood, except that there was violence everywhere. That's what we're told, and the, the there was one one guy, one dude that kept the knowledge of God in his heart and mind. The, the pathway got that narrow. Tuesday's lesson. The lesson suggests that repentance is one of the first conditions for being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, is that accurate? Uh, it doesn't matter which law lens you're viewing uh, repentance through. What is it that constitutes repentance? Do we often um, make repentance synonymous with forgiveness? Are they the same? Yes, Lisa. Maybe repentance is just the recognition that you need the Holy Spirit to help you live a Christian life. Okay. There's another quote. Uh, Colin White says, you can't even repent of yourself. You can't. You don't even have it in you to repent. But if you're willing to be made willing, He will make it. Yeah. So, so our natural state is just you know, continuing in rebellion, and it's only the wooing of the Holy Spirit that that, that kind of triggers something in our mindset. That says, you know what? I I I need to I need to forsake this. Even even repentance is a gift. Yeah, I I, what is it? I I I agree. I believe. Help my unbelief. You know. Mm hmm. Was there another hand? I I had often read you know John three. 
Christ's statement to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I thought he was saying, unless you are born again, you can't go to heaven. Yeah. And I think what he's really saying is you can't even see. You can't even understand. Your perceptions are so damaged by sin that without the Holy Spirit baptizing your mind and, and soul and, and abilities to perceive that you won't even ability to see it. Yeah, and 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 the term see, and we, we've had this we've had this conversation in here before, but again I think it bears repeating. What is what does Christ mean by you can what can't see the kingdom of God? I think it's, more than just it's not just visual yeah. seeing, like I'm seeing you. Perceive. It's it's a, a conceptualize. It's you know, on a standing or perception issue, as opposed to just a visual. Unfortunately, that's what we've been taught for. Right. Yeah. You know, Christ told those who put him on the cross that they would see him coming in clouds of glory. Well, that's more of a visual versus right. Conceptual but they still won't see the kingdom of God. Even though the kingdom kingdom's coming in the clouds, they won't quote. They won't, they won't conceptualize it. They won't perceive it. They will they will view it as an alien invasion, and they will beg for the rocks and trees to fall on them and hide them in the caves. Maybe you can also include feeling in your being. If you talk to a blind person, they say, "Well, let me let me see you." They want. Yeah, they, they touch. Touch your face. That's how they stand. <laughs> Interesting metaphor. <clears throat> uh, from the lesson, true repentance is more than just feeling sorry for the dire consequences of our sins. It is a thorough change of heart and mind, so we see sin for what it is, an ugly, evil rebellion against God. Now, <clears throat> to be sure, sin is ugly, and it's evil, and it's rebellion. But is that all it is? And why is humanity in, quote, rebellion against God? Is sin only ugly, evil rebellion? And back your answers up with some, with a couple threads of evidence. Hmm. What, does, what does scripture say sin is? Believing lies, uh, having that trust relationship broken with God, and being out of sync with. Certainly part of the cascade, but what, what does Scripture specifically say sin is? Transgression of the law. Transgression of the law, quote, lawlessness. You know what's coming next, which law? <laughs> Lovelessness. Lovelessness, yes, good. Yeah, it's transgression of the law of love. It's transgression with design law. It's transgression of natural law. Being out of harmony with the way God designed life to operate. Not only on this planet, but the rest of the universe. We as a church, knowing that God is a God of love, why do we, in the old teaching, say that the transgression of the law means the Ten Commandments? Only the ones carved in stone. I know. Get your mind around that. I why? I, You know, I... People. There are there are good questions and there are bad questions. Good questions are the ones I know the answer to. <laughs> that was not a good question. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have an answer for you, Tina. It has produced it has produced hours and hours and hours of cognitive dissonance in my head, pondering that very question. Yeah. Why have we been teaching, and why do we continue That's to indoctrinate our youth into mindsets that uh, could end up being destructive? I've had people say that we are going to a cult Sabbath school because of the things that we teach. Like, Good. And they say, like, how could you do that, Tina? <laughs> it's not that way. It's not that way. And you so just can't I get think for that. myself. I don't depend on some committee somewhere to tell me what I'm supposed to think. You know, write that one down. Yes. Um, okay, so review is a cult. Big deal. Well, I think the evidence is all around us of what you were saying, why, to this question here, I think, 
uh, Chattanooga area, I've been told, has 25,000 former Adventists. Former, nice. And then, I mean, we're talking all generations. Mm -hmm. But if you want to look at the younger <clears throat> generations, they want to think. Good. You know, and you know what? That's that's our clarion call right there. We should be we should be challenging them to think. We should be encouraging them to think. I agree with that, but then a lot of kids are thinking their way right out of the church. I mean, they well, think they think they become so liberalized that anything matters now. And regardless, I mean, we do stand for something as an Adventist church in our belief. We do stand for something. And anymore, it's like just love God. You don't have to worry about anything else. Doesn't matter. Do what you want. See, there's a difference in the 25,000 not being church members anymore. That does not mean that they've forsaken. They've eradicated self. Yeah, they, yes. they, yeah. Right. yeah. Because I you know for nearly 15 years, I would have considered myself not in the church either. You know, from the time I left here to go to California till the time I moved back. So, um, I think we're very afraid of the love of God because it is very free, but it also causes you to want to do the right things. So yes, love God and do what you want is an accurate statement. If you truly love God, He's going to change you. He'll change your motives, and yes. Out. It becomes other-centered. You become immersed in His love, and your desires will begin to align with His. Good. So, yeah. Wendell? There's a statement that's true in religion as well as in life, and it's, it's that all those that wander are not lost. Mm -hmm. It's true. Right, yeah. I have to also wonder, given the education-based centricity that we have in Chattanooga, how many that have been force-fed dogma in religion and have not been shown the true value of Christ and the true attitude of Christ, basically, I've had enough of this. You have force-fed this stuff to me. You have shoved this in every hole that I have. I've had to live and breathe your dogma for however many years. I've had enough. Yeah, and you know what? It doesn't mean that they're lost. It doesn't mean that God isn't with them. It just means, you know, they've had enough of being force-fed this constant diet. You know what? And it, that's, that's also a great manifestation of natural law. Okay? If we're violating or attempting to violate someone's liberty... Coercing. By using coercive pressure, by using do it this way or else, or uh, you have to have so many worship credits or we're going to fine you. Exactly. Then, you know, rebellion is a natural, it's a natural outgrowth of that. Either that or you surrender your thinking to the person or the institution that is coercing you and you become a mindless drone, a shadow of that person or institution who's doing the coercion. It's natural law. It is predictable. Unfortunately, the institutions inflict the concept of sinners in the hands of an angry God on the people versus the prodigal son father story. And there's a huge difference. Yep. I really like uh, some of these comments on the idea that very much because someone is not, quote, in the church does not mean that their heart is not with God. Correct. And because someone is in the church doesn't mean their heart is with God. Exactly. And that's why we're not the judge. <clears throat> the heart seeking truth, honestly, truly seeking truth, and looking and asking the universe will find God because he is the center of all truth. That's okay, good. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is, is called the spirit of love and truth, and Scripture tells us he will lead you into 80% of truth, half of truth, all truth, with a capital T. This is truth that is applied all times, all spheres, all locations, all life. With God... Would God prefer somebody that is really asking every question, searching everything out and saying, I don't know, I buy that anymore, all these sort of things. Does God prefer that or someone who just goes with the flow of, this is what I've been told, I don't ask anything, you know, this is more comfortable. 
I, the foundation of our ministry, common reason. And I think he wants those who, who have serious questions. You know, truth, truth loses nothing to investigation. Right? You know, God doesn't have anything to hide. His government is open to inspection. He, he welcomes it because he knows it's the design for life. And those, those, who, those who have deep, earnest questions and even are angry because they've been taught a lie... He welcomes. He wants to hear it. He wants to. He wants to hear our grievances. He wants to hear our distortions. And he wants to clear them up. It's like we're saying: if you open your heart and say, "Lord, lead me," that's dangerous. If you ascribe to a specific set of doctrines and a, an organization, that's safe. That doesn't make any sense. Right, Wendell. Well, I have to speak up for the church, though. Yeah, good. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And, and the, the worst bugs in the world are in my hospital. But I can assure you that you'll get better orthopedic care there than out on the streets. I, I, I think that's, that's a great metaphor, great analogy. Yes, but I wouldn't get sick if I went to your hospital. It's safer for me to be outside of your hospital than in your hospital, right? <laughs> All right, here, here we go. Yeah, yeah. You are better served. You're, yeah, that's right. You, you're gonna get. You're gonna get. Your own trying to fix your broken bones. You're gonna get better. I, you'll certainly get better with be character at the hospital than you will at my physical therapy clinic because I don't maintain a sterile field anywhere. I don't. I don't need. I don't have to. Yes, sir. We were discussing uh, about water baptism, and and we was talking about teaching these our children different things that has nothing to do with our salvation and they're getting sick of it. Well, did we decide where water baptism was a useless thing? We want to, as John said, one after him comes baptizing in the spirit and with fire. So are we not going to teach water baptism anymore. Christ said, go ye to all the world, teaching everything I've commanded you, baptizing them. Pretty much serious. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I hope no one takes away from here that I'm, I'm suggesting we just need to do away with uh, water baptism and the symbology of it in a public declaration of repentance and an intent to uh, travel a different path. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm, I, my job here is to facilitate thought. Right. I, I know uh, a lot of people say, well, Jesus, uh, he was baptized. And, yeah. Well, but he was a priest after the Melchizedek <laughs> order, and that was the rule at 30 years old. They were baptized then. They officially became uh, a priest then. Mm -hmm. Okay. In that order. So that's the reason he was baptized at 30. And now why are we baptized with water now? Well, I don't think that was the only reason. I don't think that was the only reason he was baptized. Uh, I, I think he did it at setting forth an example of how he wanted his followers to, um, mm -hmm. oh, okay. to behave. God acknowledged this is my beloved son whom I want pleased. Right. I mean, God acknowledged the act of his baptism. That was the first time, yes. Mm -hmm. First time we're told of, anyway. Just in the natural law sense, baptism affects us. After you have been baptized and become part of a entity, you are more apt to study and continue in that realm than if you do not take and participate. Also well said. Um, continue, down lower in Tuesday's lesson, the, the lesson uses the word trust as synonymous with faith, which, uh, I, which pleased me. Uh, however, can we receive, uh, the lesson suggests that it's, you can't receive the Holy Spirit without, quote, trusting God's word. Is this accurate? Well, how about the people that the Holy Spirit speaks to that have never heard of God's word? Thank you. What about Abraham? How much scripture was written when Abraham was walking our planet? Now, to be fair, the being that we understand to be Christ came and spoke face to face with him, and God spoke in voices that he could he could he could hear. So, you could argue that he 
trusted God's word, but it, was it God's word he trusted, or was it God himself he trusted? Yeah, probably also told there would be people in there who would walk up to Christ and say, what's with the holes in your arms? Yeah. How about Enoch? Walk with God, walking to heaven. Enoch? Yeah. Okay, yep. How much of. So, um, I guess I had a little bit of an issue with this quote, trusting God's word, which is almost always a euphemism for the little black book we know as the Holy Bible. Okay? God's bigger than this little black book. And his word really means more than just the written Bible. Right. And. The word was with God. <clears throat> And you, know, you can't confine an infinite God in 66 books or however many there are. The, you know, it's like this process of trusting the promises of God. You know, claim the promises of God and trust his promises. Well, are we trusting the promise or are we trusting the God who gave the promise? Okay, when, when you're a kid and your mother or father said, hey, I've got a present for you at home. You know, it got fired up. Did you, because they told you you got a present or because you trusted that the parent was reliable? Oh. Right, but it was the trust and the reliability that got the excitement when they said, I've got a gift for you. It's a lot different than a guy driving up in a van, a stranger. Yeah, yeah. Got some candy in the back. There's no windows in the van. I don't want anyone else to see it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Briefly, Wednesday's lesson. This is part two of the conditions. Uh, from the lesson. Then, as now, the Holy Spirit is granted to all who obey God. In the Bible, love and obedience go hand in hand, and true faith is expressed in obedience. Is this accurate? Well, he is granted to all who obey God, but he's also granted those who don't obey God both ways. Is true faith expressed in obedience? Yes. I would say yes. I think the heart transformation is what changes the heart to desire to do. Okay, this is one of my this is one of my horse you know getting the cart in front of the horse issues. Let's. What about Balaam? Remember Balaam, the quote prophet of God. In his heart, he wanted to curse Israel for profit. God said, you will say only what I, the words I give you to say. He obeyed God. He said, he told, he got up and prophesied what God told him to prophesy, much to the consternation of the pagan king. Did he obey God? Was he obedient? In the technical sense, yes. Was his heart filled with love for God? Was he faithful? Did he have true faith expressed in obedience? I think there's a difference between saying doing certain things exhibits true faith and saying if you have true faith, you will do certain things. Okay, yeah, again, it matters. Yep, cart before the horse. James 1.22, don't play games with yourselves by merely listening to God's prescription. Apply it and do what it says. Yeah, I am yeah, first John two four. I mean this is you know, from the lesson. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his words in him verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby we know that we are in him. So yes, uh, certainly a faith and a love faith in and love for our creator will manifest itself in certain uh, certain ways, and it can be evidenced uh, to ourselves and to others. And I think obedience is one of those. But Guaranteed. obedience is not necessarily, I mean, you can, you, how many of you were teenagers one time and you sullenly obeyed your parents just because you didn't want the, the punishment that you knew would come from disobedience? Okay, does that, does that affect your character one way or another? It could be both beneficial and harmful. I, I tried to look up, there, there's, there's an Ellen White quote about sullen obedience and I, I couldn't find it. I, I found 
I found one similar, but it's not it's not the one I was looking for. I'll read it anyway, and we'll wrap up with that. A mechanical obedience may hide the smoldering fire of rebellion, but it is ready to break out at any time against restraint. In the service of such, there is no peace or light or love. The atmosphere surrounding their souls is not fragrant. The influence of their words and actions is felt by others. And this influence is a harm even to those who are trying to do their best in any position in which they are placed. Self-pity is deteriorating to the characters of those who cherish it. And it exerts an influence that spoils the happiness of others. This is from Medical Missionary 173. Mechanical obedience may have the smoldering fires of rebellion. So, obedience is not necessarily an indication that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. However, being filled with the Holy Spirit will lead to compliance and obedience simply because we're now, we're at that level seven. We're at level seven of moral development where we are cooperating friend of God. We understand design law. We choose to work in harmony with God's government, his ways and methods and principles because it's the way of life and we are challenged and we are filled with a desire to bring others into that uh, same understanding as well. Let's wrap up prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit and for what it does in our lives and we ask that you guide us into allowing us to open our hearts to a greater measure of the Holy Spirit. Elisha asked for a double measure of the Holy Spirit um, and encourage us to do the same. Please uh, guide each of us for the remainder of the day and the weekend and bring us safely back in the weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.